are going to go over the night's action, uh, Danny White's actions, Ohio State's roster subtractions, and UB's hopes for some Saturday traction. Hold it off. Uh, we will be joined by Ian from Land Grant Holy Land. We'll get to throw some questions into him about this week's opponent. Uh, but first, let's go over the tonight's scores real quick. Um, it was the opening college football, and of course, that means midweek football, and that means a lot of MAC. And there were there were four teams going on. Two of them we'll see later. First up, Kent took on Liberty, and the Liberty Gills gave Kent all they could handle. Uh, in the end, Kent scored a late fourth quarter touchdown to beat them. Uh, the big news out of that game, though, was Dree, Ar Dree Archer going down. Is there any word on how long he's going to be out? Because that kind of killed Kent's offense. Uh, Connor, have you heard anything? I haven't heard anything on Archer. He was walking around in a walking boot. He was on the sideline. He seemed in good spirits from what we could see. So there, I, I believe he should be okay. The announcers were saying that he should be okay for next week, but I'm sure we'll, see, we'll hear more about it this week. Uh, the other team we're going to take on today, uh, take on this season, is Bowling Green. And they went into a game, and uh, Tulsa came into Bowling Green. Bowling Green was a big underdog, and they just destroyed uh, what is supposedly the best team in Conference USA. Uh, Tulsa scored a garbage time touchdown, but the final 34-7. to And that Bowling Green defense, which was a monster deal with last year, is looking even scarier this year. Um did you get a chance to catch that one, Conrad, at all? Uh, I saw a bit of it. That's the, probably the game I saw the least of. But Bowling Green's defense seemed to be the story. They got a lot of turnovers. They got a lot of help. Missed field goals. I think Tulsa missed two mm -hmm. field goals. Uh, they fumbled in the red zone. So I don't know how much of it is Bowling Green's defense and how much of it was Tulsa just not being ready for the opening game. But they look, mm -hmm. they look scary. That was the team that scares us. And the other thing that was scary was they benched their quarterback that beat us last year, Schiltz. They put in this new guy, Johnson, yeah. who is a threat to run. And we're awful against quarterbacks who are a threat to run. So, you know, we have to not only get through their tough defense, but now we have to stop a running quarterback. But we'll get some practice at that this week. Yeah, definitely. Um, the one game I completely ignored intentionally was Akron at UCF. I don't. I, I didn't expect much out of Akron, and, and I guess by the final score, 38-7, to seven, Akron wow. didn't do too much. And, again, I think that was a late fourth-quarter touchdown. And that's Danny Barretts and uh, Alan Mulgridge at UCF, some of our old offensive mm -hmm. coordinators. Akron is the same team they've been for the last three or four years. Uh, the last one was uh, Ball State, and, and that one started out ugly. It started out, uh, I think Illinois State was up at the half. Uh, but Ball State, you know, finally got their feet under them, turned it on, and just went completely ballistic on Illinois State in the second half. And I watched a lot of the fourth quarter, and I think Wenning was still in, and he was still throwing the ball 20, 30 yards downfield. Um, they basic, basically, Illinois State got urban mired. You know, they got <laughs> no mercy, no subs. Let's just see how many points we can put up. Um, overall, the night, I'm pretty happy about it. I wish Kent had, had shown better, but you lose your best player, you have a brand-new coach, you kind of expect that. Uh, Ball State, you know, had the jitters, you know. Uh, you see that all the time, even when, like, the power teams take on the mid-majors. You see they struggle in that first quarter and a half of the first game. Uh, Akron's Akron. There's nothing we can really do about them except for wait for soccer. And then, you know, Bowling Green... They're going to be tough. You know, I, I was thinking maybe we could take the East. There's been a lot of hype, and I'm starting to buy into it. But watching them tonight, that's going to be a really hard game. Speaking of hard games, we got Ian from Land Grant Holy Land, uh, which is the SB Nation blog for Ohio State, uh, who is the lucky team that gets to face us this weekend. Um, we're, originally, we were going to have Dave in here and Walls kind of pepper you with questions. We'll see what, we, what Conrad and I can come up with. Uh, the first thing I kind of wanted to ask you was, uh, obviously, all the, the personnel issues you guys are having. And, you know, some of them are really unfortunate injuries. I know you lost a backup defensive lineman just Monday. You know, we hope all those guys heal up and get better. Uh, but there's been a lot of issues with suspensions. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go into details because, obviously, those things are getting kind of thrown out or thrown down and 
we love the big headlines, and a lot of these were big headlines, but they still are issues. Is this kind of uh, Urban Meyer cleaning up after Trestle? Is this just some freak aberration, or is this kind of par for the course when you get up in those big conferences and you got to kind of swallow some behaviors you might not want to do? <clears throat> um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, as far as Urban cleaning out from what Trestle left behind, I don't think there's any issue there. Uh, there's not a lot of attitudes. I mean, I think you look at the guys that got suspended, um, Carlos Hyde, Bradley Roby, they leave their attitudes mostly on the field. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. both got you know some run-ins with the police and whatnot. But um, for the most part, I, I just think it was kind of a freak accident type of thing. You know, It's not going to be the norm for Ohio State. So... Well, I thought it was weird because it, it, it hadn't been. I mean, you say a lot about Trestle, and, yeah, there was Tatgate, and there, were, there was all these other things, but he seemed to run at least outwardly a pretty clean team, but it's like he's gone a year. And it's like when you buy a new house. You know, it looks great, and you walk in there, and you start seeing all the cracks in the walls and where the foundation's not right now. I was just wondering, maybe uh, Trestle was playing a little fast and loose and just kind of keeping things under the table, but I'm um, glad you're I, I hate even teams I don't like, like once for the Big Ten and SEC, I hate when that kind of stuff happens because it, it does kind of pull down everybody. Um, and I, I wanted to ask about the SEC. Um, Ohio State is, you know, favored to win the Big Ten this year, favored, you know, by pretty much everybody. Last year they struggled in a lot of games they shouldn't have struggled in. And then you saw what happens. To, the Big Ten has seemed to kind of degrade a bit in terms of its prestige. Is it that the Big Ten has has fallen down for a little bit, or has the SEC just made everybody look bad recently? Because that's, as a mid major, that's kind of our perception. Is now there, there's a there's a three tiered system now. There's the SEC, then right behind them are the ten, the twelve, and the ACC, and then way behind you guys is the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the SEC has done a pretty good job of showing who's dominating the college football landscape the past couple of years. I mean, they have that streak of wins in national title games that nobody has been able to touch. And it started with us. In fact, it started with Urban Meyer coaching Florida. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, uh, I, I think the SEC has done a good job of that. Um, do I think the Big Ten has been diminished at all? I mean, it's tough to say. Um, some years there's always surprise teams that either disappoint or do a lot better than what you thought they would do. Um, so I think it's pretty much overall the same. Um, Michigan lately has been getting back to what they used to be. Um, Ohio State's been pretty consistent. Uh, Northwestern this year is looking like they could be a threat. Um, Michigan State, you know, they, they've been pretty consistent under D'Antonio. So, I mean, it's just it's going to be interesting to see how the Big Ten does this year. A lot has been made of your schedule this year, starting with Buffalo, San Diego State, Cal's on a down year. Uh, Ohio State is actually one of the teams that I respect that usually go out and play. They came out here to UFC a couple years ago, played Texas. How are the fans dealing with this year's week schedule? You know, it's it's kind of different for us. Um, like you said, we usually go out and play the big teams like USC and Texas. Um, when we scheduled Cal, obviously they were doing a lot better than they have been the past couple years. Um, they had, you know, job at best. Um, that was a big player for them. Um, lately, they haven't been as as good as they've been in the past, and I mean that's that's going to happen when you schedule teams that are ahead of you know so far ahead of your time. Um, like right now, we have scheduled games with Virginia Tech and Oklahoma. You know, nobody knows how they're gonna how good they're gonna be in the next couple of years. So it's it's really not that big of a deal as far as, as far as out of conference because it's going to happen at some point. Um, would we love to play bigger teams? Yeah, I mean, it makes our schedule better, makes us a better team, looks better in front of the media. But for what we have right now, I mean, even with this schedule, it's tough to run the table. And going 24-0 is pretty unlikely. Uh, we we like to think we have a great shot at it, but it's there might be a loss in there. I can't, I couldn't tell you who that team would be, but it might happen. So. Yeah, you know, you, I've been want, reading uh, Land Grant Holy Land a lot this week, and you guys have had a lot of good uh, insights into a few Buffalo players. Um, 
in what freak occurrences do you think have to happen for Buffalo to actually maybe give you guys a game or even you know pull an Appy State versus Michigan type of deal? I th- I would I'd have to say one the number one thing ma- Braxton, you can't use the word magic. Just so you, can't. Know, you can't say magic. You can't say miracle. Okay. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll go with um Braxton has to get hurt for one and that I mean Ooh. God forbid that happens but um. He'd probably have to get taken out of the game. Uh, even then, it's it's going to be tough. It really comes down to, I think, how our defense plays. Um, we got a lot of uh, young guys on the front seven, so I think it'll be interesting to see how they do. Um, but even even with Miller going down, we still have Guyton, who, you know, pulled his big game stunts against uh, Purdue last year. Um, I just... I, I don't know if it could happen, even with Miller going down, but um, I would give you a better shot. Let's go with that. Speaking of Miller, I've been looking at him, especially during the spring game, and he looked a lot better than he did two years ago. And I didn't really see that much of Ohio State last year, so I was really surprised at the progression that he's made as a passer and as a dis- uh, and as his decision-making. How has Miller uh, evolved in the last year and maybe – since the off season. Well, the biggest thing I think that Miller has progressed on um, that the coaching staff, the coaching staff has talked about, um, has been his footwork and, as you mentioned, his decision making. Um, a lot of the times you'd see Braxton rolling around in the pocket trying to make a play, passing the ball. When in reality, all he had to do was use his natural ability and run. And you think that's kind of weird for a, a quarterback with his talents, but he's always been a kind of pass-first type of guy, the runs that he has are normally designed plays. And um, when he scrambles out of the pocket, it's, it usually works out for him, and that's why he's such a great athlete. Uh, he's really He worked in the offseason during the summer with one of those um, quarterback, those famous quarterback coaches, and you know he, he's obviously gotten a lot better, and we're excited to see how he does. Now you you had mentioned the defense was kind of kind of the one area you might be a little bit concerned about. Um, you know you you lost. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot what his name was, but you lost your backup nose tackle with a broken foot. You've lost uh, three cornerbacks, two to suspension, one lost the team, and in general your front seven is pretty inexperienced. So you guys usually when these t- type of games happen, and Buffalo has a, a history of hanging really tight with teams for you know the first half or or most of the first half. Um, Usually what happens in these games is you get to that second half and then that depth kicks in. You know, the difference of your second guys versus our second guys. Uh, but, you know, now you have inexperience and, and your depth has been severely hit on those units. So uh, not just for the Buffalo game, but going forward, I mean, how bad is that going to be for you? Well, I mean, it, it hurts to only have, like, 71, 72 guys that are on scholarship right now. Um because of the injuries or the um, suspensions that you mentioned. Uh, Tommy Shutt is the defensive lineman that you were thinking of. Um, Him being out hurts, um, but the nice thing about the defensive line is that we're going to be rotating a lot of different guys in anyway. So Mm -hmm. I'm not too concerned, but, I mean, it's definitely going to play into how the defense plays. Um, I I don't want to say... That the defense is too inexperienced, but I mean the the linebackers. I mean besides Ryan Shazier, you have Curtis Grant, who was a big time recruit coming in to Ohio State and hasn't produced anything as of yet. So there are big expectations for him this year. And then you have Joshua Perry, who played a little bit last year, but was just learning the linebacker position for Ohio State. And so we're expecting some things from him this game to see what he can do for the rest of the season. Uh, my last question is, last year we uh, introduced the world to Todd Gurley. He was a freshman, never heard of him, didn't speak about him before the game, and he ripped off a big kick return, had almost 100 yards rushing, and he's taken off since then, and he's people have been talking about him in Heisman this year. Who is the freshman at Ohio State uh, who's going to break out against us uh, in the Ohio State game that we don't know about yet? Well, I mean, whenever you bring up the freshman kind of breakout season 
title, you have to mention Dontre Wilson. And I'm sure you guys have heard of him by now, um, especially if you've been reading the site. We've kind of raved on and on about him, just like everybody else has. Uh, the coaching staff's extremely high on him. He'll be, Coach Meyer said that he will be returning kickoffs um, to start the game against Buffalo. Uh, he's incredibly fast, um, elusive, uh, just your typical athlete, and I think we'll see him in the H-back role kind of as a running back, wide receiver mix. So he's definitely one to look out for. Um, Ezekiel Elliott could possibly be one. He's a running back, a freshman running back, that could um, come in and get some snaps early on and really take off. Uh, Jalen Marshall, he's dealing with a concussion as of late, but he's on the depth chart, listed at, on the depth chart for the game. So we might see a couple snaps with him in some different formations, and he has the potential to be a big – game changer for us. My last question is, if that very, very, very improbable happens and Buffalo pulls out a win, what form of ritual suicide will Ohio State fans <laughs> demand of Urban Meyer? Uh, they won't. They won't. But, uh, I mean, they'll, they'll be upset, of course. Um, I, I don't think people expect – for us to lose a game this year, and I mean, well, maybe that's not the right words, but it, it's very hard <laughs> to go 24-0. I mean, to win to win every single game on your schedule back-to-back, -back, that's incredibly difficult. Um, so it's going to happen at some point, whether it be against Buffalo or Wisconsin or Nebraska, or not Nebraska, but uh, Northwestern. You know, it one of the games they might have trouble getting out of, and if they don't, it's not the end of the world. Um, mm -hmm. Would we like to run the table? Yes. Um, it, it's just it's it's extremely difficult to go twenty four now. All right. Well, thanks, Ian, uh, for coming on. You can you can hang out if you want, or, or drop off and you know go do whatever Buckeye fans do. Uh, <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> Buckeye fans win. That's what you're supposed to say. All right. Yeah. <laughs> thanks well, a lot. That too. All right. Have a good one, guys. You do. I wanted to keep this uh, week just about the upcoming game because, oh, it's been so long since we've had uh, UB football. But Danny White just will not let that happen, and he had himself one heck of a week. Um, the first thing he did was he did that mini press conference right before the Jeff Quinn press conference on Tuesday. And I don't know if he had a chance to watch it, Conrad, but that was one of the least information-given press conferences I've ever seen. <laughs> which, 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 to me, kind of strikes me, right? I mean, you don't go out there and sit in front of the press and make a five-minute statement, and you effectively say nothing of substance other than, and this is what stuck out to me, you know, we are not selling what UB is or who we are. We are selling what we are going to become. You know, and it was a very firm of this is what we're going to become, not we want to become this. Um, and it struck me as almost a mission statement, right? Now, I'm, I'm normally not a big fan of those. Very few people do mission statements well. They're almost always used covering competent management. But uh, when they're done well, they're, you know, they're very effective. And, and that one kind of hit me. Um, and my initial thought after that was, can we please have Danny White do all the football conferences, right? Because he went out there, he was well-spoken, clear, impactful, and he was followed by Jeff Quinn, who might know football well. Um, but he just... He, he's awful in front of the press. It's one of the big contrasts between him and Turner Gill. Turner Gill would go and look comfortable up there and interact, and look. you could see the thought process going on. And Jeff Quinn seems to go up there with a with a kind of a cheat sheet on his hand of, like, every play, next bowl in, five Fs. And uh, you could tell he doesn't like being up there in front of the press. You know, that is not the part of his job he likes. Um and, and up until this afternoon, that's what I was going to lead with when we talked about the conference. But then he comes out with the ne the what's it the New York Bulls initiative, and uh, that to me struck me as kind of a thumb in the eye of all of his critics, and, and a good one. I like you know this is kind of him doubling down, saying, "Oh, you don't like the New York patch? You, oh, you don't like the basketball court? Well, let me tell you the next thing I'm going to do. I'm going to go pair up with New Era and Coke and all these local businesses." And I'm going to go get all of our, all the alumni who have money that I can get. We're going to form a board. We're going to call it the New York Bulls. Um, is this is this him throwing down the gauntlet and saying, "Look, within a few years, we're going to be the New York Bulls. You just got to accept that." 
I think so. What do you think? Uh, the New York Bulls initiative logo is probably the logo that we should have right now on the, the chest. New, University of Buffalo on the top, New York Bulls. It's simple, clean, and it's clear mm -hmm. what we want to what we want to call ourselves. We're used to the world of Ward Manuel, who, like I said, I, I will always praise the job he did at Buffalo. I'm sure UConn fans don't feel that way tonight. Um, but, you know, he came into the department and he made them serious about athletics and, and he dragged them kicking and screaming, I think, as far as he could with who he was, right? He he was a man to take a department that had absolutely no interest in competing at the MAC level and get them to where they at least wanted to. And it seems Danny White is going to take him to the next step. And unlike where Manuel, who would say, we're going to get that field house done eventually, um, uh, Danny White does not strike me as a guy who likes open-ended dates. And... Every time, every time I'm like, okay, this is this is where he's going to let the rest of Buffalo catch their breath and and, and, and come to where he is. He's out. Uh, nope, nope. Um, 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 he's playing chess while we're all playing checkers. Well, that's the end of the Danny White segment of the show, and we can uh, jump to uh, let's get to this week's game. And I had talked to Ian about some of the depth issues. Uh, I just wanted to be clear about what those were. They are missing uh, their starting cornerback. They're missing the cornerback that was going to fill in for him. They're missing the cornerback that was going to fill in for the guy who filled in, who left for Kent State. Uh, that, I mean, they're missing now a defensive lineman. So they have one experienced guy in their front seven. They're missing a, They're missing probably their best backup. Now, they do have a lot of – he's he's not wrong when he says they got a lot of depth on the, on the defensive line. Um, they are missing – now, the, the strong area of their defense was the defensive backfield coming into this year, and now they're missing you know a couple of their best players there and a depth player, too. On the other side of the ball, they're missing their best two running backs, and they're missing two of their uh, utility tight ends. Uh, this, I don't know, I, you know I, I'm not going to say upset because I do realize, again, go buy a lottery ticket, you got better odds at this point. But... Ohio State is definitely shaping up to be a team that we can at least put a scare into for a good portion of the game. I, I, I think what we did at Georgia last year is more than repeatable this year. And, I, and that 35-point line is just completely out of whack. Yeah. Uh, you don't agree? Well, you know, was, Georgia was the same way. They had a lot of suspensions. And we, we played pretty well against Georgia. We did not play to win that game. No, I, we scared them. I mean, they, they had to go. I mean, not scared as in like, oh, we're going to lose this game. But, I mean, they went in a half time only up by a touchdown on Buffalo. I mean, that had to hit them a little bit. So that, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I think eventually, unless Mac plays his best game ever, unless everything falls into place perfectly, by the time we get to the fourth quarter, I think UB is going to be really tired. I, I, you know, and... These games are decided with your with your second with your second stringers. When your second guys come in, so that your main team can get a breath on those long drives, and that's the end of the drive because they're going to score the next play. That's when the blow up starts, and that like that's what Ball State did to Illinois State tonight. You know, Ball State got their feet under them. Illinois State got winded, and it was just over after that. It was basically Ball State scrimmaging. Uh, I I think thirty five is probably. Where it should be, um, mm -hmm. I, I can't give us any any respect. I mean, we played well against Georgia, but then we saw the rest of that season. Um, I can't. Oh yeah, no, I, I don't. Yeah, I agree with you. Go on. I'm sorry. Go on. Yeah, I, I just so I don't. I think it's it's nice that Ohio State is giving us the gift of taking out some of their best players, um, and I mm -hmm. I think if if we play our best game, we can keep it. Competitive. I wrote today. If the longer we keep it competitive, the more the pressure goes on Ohio State. So I'm actually mm -hmm. the opposite of you. I think the thing that killed us in Georgia were the big plays. I think you take away the kick return, you take away a 50-yard run, you take away a deep pass, and you have a tie game in the third quarter. Uh, and you also take away Quinn's coaching. He we had the ball inside the five-yard line and we settled up for a field goal instead of oh, yeah. you know. Going for the touchdown. If you're really going, if you're really inside the five against Georgia with a chance to score a touchdown and be down what three points. You take that. Yeah, but, yeah it, it would have been. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, he was already yeah, playing, three points. In, in my head, he was playing that game just to be competitive from the from the get go. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that kind of leads us into the next thing you know you want to say is what do you need to see out of this game to be happy? Other than let's, other than that check clearing and nobody getting hurt, what what do you need to see out of this game for you to for you to get the warm and fuzzies and be like you know what this season could finally be where the where the dam breaks and and we are no longer back to being the moribund team in the MAC. You know, I, there's nothing I can see because I mean, if you look back at what we wrote after Georgia, that was pretty much the perfect uh, paycheck game. That just tells me these games mean nothing, uh, and there's nothing mm-hmm. I can take away from it. So the most important thing, the only thing that makes me happy is, like you said, check players, healthy players, and guys who aren't too tired to be to read up to compete in the game next week. I don't know. You know, you keep saying Baylor's going to be a level game. H- has that drug test from Dave got to you yet? Because <laughs> they just got so much speed. I mean, we'll get to them next week. Um you know, uh, we're going to talk about the record watch, and, and obviously, maybe this can make us happy, right? Maybe if it's a blowout, we have Oliver needs two touchdowns to catch Cliff uh, Clifford Scott. If he gets 100 yards, he will tie Swan with the most 100-yard games in the team's history. Newts needs just 36 yards to catch Nap. Uh, if he gets 120, I think he gets to fifth all time. He catches Brett Hamlin. Um, Cleo Mack, of course, is, has the UB records he's going to have. He is hunting down. Uh, he's hunting down the NCAA records. He needs, uh, what, three forced fumbles and 19 tackles for loss to tie the NCAA records. And Nadja Johnson needs uh, one, just one pass defended to catch Dave Short at number eight all-time for UV. Um, who, who, has, who, who has the best chance of really coming away from this game with their names flying up? Uh, well, Johnson's going to get a lot of balls thrown his way. I'm sure Ohio State is not going to be a team that's going to respect our number one or number two options. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to see... I don't expect Mac to really get in the backfield that much because of the zone read. They're going to read him probably coming off the edge and avoid him. So I, I expect him not mm-hmm. to get there. I think with these suspensions, that really opens up the field for Alex Newts. He is our, he's been our only option, and against this defense that plays uh, a lot of zone... He's going to be inside, outside, double covered, uh, and he's done. A, he's made his whole career basically beating that double coverage when the quarterback's staring him down the whole time, and just being a freak on offense. So now that he doesn't have a first-round NFL draft pick lining up against him, he might have actually some room to do some damage. Uh, and then Oliver, mm. I think if we're going to be competitive, it depends. We need 100 yards from him. He has to have at least 100 yards for us to be competitive. What are your keys to UB actually putting a scare into Ohio State? Okay, so on offense, I run opening up the pass. We did it against Georgia, and that's the only way that we're going to be able to do it against Ohio State. They're inexperienced but athletic, so we want them thinking and not reacting. So if we can get traction, if we can move the ball, if we can have, if we can, uh, have them break out of what they want to do, and what they want to do is rush four and drop seven. Drop seven in the zone, mm. get pressure on you, and just kind of just wait for you to make a mistake. And if we can mm. force them out of that zone and get Alex Newton on one-on-one coverage against a backup, backup, backup cornerback, we have a good chance. Uh, if if mm. Bo can run for 100, 150, we have a good chance. And if anyone who's not named Alex Newton can get open in the middle of the field, we'll have a good chance to move the ball. On defense, Braxton Miller really scares me. So, and we are, I mean, in 10 years, I can't think of us beating a mobile quarterback. Nate Davis, is he considered a mobile quarterback? And and he just, you know, Oh, he, he was, was, but that was, he right. was, but that was a freaky defense we had that year. Right, he, and he washed his hands in butter before the game, so that helped a lot. I don't yeah. think Braxton Miller would do that. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be, they, 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 they use the zone read, the pistol formation, so they have a lot of options, and we're going to just have to be very disciplined. And we're the veteran defense on the field, so the question is, are we going to be able to be disciplined? Can we contain Brex Miller, keep him in the pocket, not let him run around? Can we force him left mm-hmm. and make sure that he has to throw across his body? Yeah, for me, it's 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 about the right side of the offensive line. Because, like, we're not going to be able to stop Ohio State from scoring. Right? We're just not. Um, they're going to get their chances. They're going to score. They're, 
like I said, Braximo is just too good. I mean, it's like when we played Balor when RG3 was there. You know, they're going to they're going to score. They're going to move the ball. They got they have a great quarterback who's a dual threat. And we have, like you said, Gill, Hoffer, Quinn. It seems like no one has coached Buffalo has ever been able to deal effectively with a dual threat. So so that the other thing is, uh, I think that it's offense, right? It's like I said, the run has to open up the pass, but for that to happen. You know, Mize are going to be on the right side of that line at the beginning of the game. If they can play to the level that uh, Oz can play last year, uh, we can and we can move the ball. And especially the other nice thing is you slow the game down. Maybe you go with that, you know, the slow no huddle uh, that we saw Quinn use at times last year. Like I said, young and experienced defense, just get lined up right away, then figure out your play and don't let them substitute, make them think and react. Um if, but if they start bowling over, if Oliver can't get off that side of the line, it's going to be a long day. And, you know, I, I'm hoping really for a few good drives where Lakata has time and Lakata can develop because he's not – he will face a better secondary this season, I think, because of all the suspensions. But I, he, I don't think he'll face playing in that environment like he's going to play in this week. And if he can do it this week and get some confidence behind him, that's going to make all the difference once we hit conference play. They like to – Send they I most of what I saw they like to send only four, uh, and then they mm-hmm. have a they have a flex safety a safety who plays like an Ed Reed Trey Palomalu type, who will just be all over the field. That's gonna be tough mm-hmm. for Lakata. He's gonna have to locate that guy before every play, know where he's every at. Play. You know that's that's where your interceptions come. Lakata is pretty much you know our disclaimer every week. He's a, he's still 130 snaps into his career. That's going to be. He's dangerous. halfway through his first year. Right. Yeah. That's going to be a dangerous guy, and that'll be on the right side most most of the time. Um. And then I, you know, Ohio State seems to be really good against non-mobile quarterbacks because they like to they don't contain as well as we need to, so they like to to charge hard upfield, and you know we have to keep Lakata, we have to keep a good pocket around Lakata and keep him upright. And give him a little bit of time to find someone other than Newts. Okay, um, let's let's get it. Let's let's run into predictions. Oh, um, and I, I'm going to predict uh, Ohio State 35 and the New York Bulls 10. Uh, so you know, I, I think there's a potential for UB to score 17, 20 points. Again, if if the right side of the line is there, and if Oliver can really Really make Ohio think about the run and, and and lay off the receivers a little bit. You know, Licata when he when he has time, he can he can put some really good passes out there. It reminds me a lot of Drew Willie with his ability to just find the right spot. Not you know not not the strongest arm you're ever going to see. I think he's a stronger arm than Willie had maybe. Um, but the big thing that I like that we haven't seen since Willie even with Zach Maynard is that touch. And hopefully, you know, we're, I, so I don't think we'll beat them with, I don't think we're going to beat them with the long ball. I don't think we're going to get one or two fluke long plays. I think if we score 10 to 17 to 20 points, it's going to be off two or three nice long drives. So yeah, I, I my, my prediction is 37-20, two field goals, two touchdowns. I think, I mean, I think the potential is there for long uh, scores just because of the inexperience in their secondary they play that cover four, and the temptation is basically the safeties are responsible for the deep wide receiver uh, and mm-hmm. their side of the field. So the temptation is if we cross anyone across the side of the field, those safeties have to let that guy go and cover Newt. So if we have, say, we have Fred Lee in the slot, if he runs a post through the middle, that safety has to pull out and cover Newt's deep. And I think if we can get those two, if we can give Lakata some time, there's that moment. Like I said, we want them thinking. That moment where that safety is to think, am I supposed to cover over top of uh, of Newts, or am I supposed to cover over top of Lee? That one second of thought will make one of those receivers wide open. So we have the chance to do it, but we need our we need to have that second wide receiver who's really an option. We need to have Lakata. Uh, comfortable and reading the defense so he can make that decision in a second, and we need to give him time to throw the ball. I don't know if we can do all those things. We could. We did mm-hmm. against Pittsburgh. It, the last, two years ago, we lost the game to Pittsburgh. 
and we were able to confuse their secondary. We dropped the ball once the ball got there to wide open guys. Yeah. But you know, we're but I will say this. Jeff Quinn is an offensive genius. He's not I don't know if he's the best game manager, I'll say this, but I he can look at a defense and break break it down and find the weaknesses. And I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure he has a few plays, big plays in his playbook that are going to exploit the Ohio State defense. It's up to us to execute it and that's and it's up to him to call the play at the right time. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll just have to see if that if, if anything big happens. Why is Newt's returning punts? Right? If, if Hughes looked good returning punts, you know, I know what Jeff Quinn said that press conference, you want to put your best playmakers out there. But, you know, you, you, don't, you don't see your best receivers on most teams returning punts. And that's for a reason. Even though your best receiver is probably the guy who would do the best job returning punts, I mean, you have to be a little crazy to return punts. You really do. And and Newt's might be that kind of crazy because we see some of the catches he makes, but right. do you want your best receiver opening himself up to those kind of hits he's going to get? You know, I think no. I, I, I question that. I mean, we had, in 08, we had Roosevelt and we had Ernest Jackson returning kickoffs and punts and Hamlin sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. They were all. I feel like they were different kinds. Like Roosevelt and Hamlin were smaller guys. The guys you typically see returning punts, speedy, smaller. Uh, Newt's is pretty big. He's a big target back there. But he, but he, he might be our best option. And I would say, you know, maybe Newt's campaign for this. If he's preparing his film for NFL, you know, he needs to. He might have to make a team as a punt returner. If that's the case, then I'm very happy about. It. If, if this is a make Alex Newt's a better player for Alex Newt's situation, I'm all for it. As far as our number two quarterback wide receiver situation, I it, it drives me nuts. I don't know why we can't find one. Yeah. At the end of the day, it just maybe Newt's is just going to go back there and fair catch it. I mean, remember, uh, we, we remember that Northern Illinois game when by, by the second quarter, we're screaming, just fair catch the ball, and they couldn't even do that. I don't, you know, fine, they punt the ball 40 yards, just catch it, or just get out of the way and let it go. You know, we, we, you know, but it's confusing me because all I did was I read several places that Hughes was looking really good returning punts uh, during spring ball, and it, it's a shame that we got to take a guy like Newt, who, like you said, is a huge target, and, and put him down there, and, and nobody, no one likes hitting other people than more than the guys who run down the field on special teams because that's the only reason you're on the field is to right. kill the other guy. So so your prediction was, I think, what did you say the score was going to be? 37-20. 37-20. I would be happy with that game. 37-20, nobody hurt. Check clears. All right. I think we see a clone of the Georgia game from last year. And mm-hmm. I think we just all come back a little once bitten, twice shy, not really reading as much into it as we did last year. Yeah, uh, yeah. When we when we when we beat a Mac East team, then then we'll start to. <laughs> that's not UMass. We, we we can start to get uh get up on that. Um, and I'll throw this out there just because we got a couple minutes. Um, UConn, did they just get a whole lot more beatable, <laughs> or or is this going to make them harder to beat? I can't believe that not only that they lost, but how they lost. I mean, they're just. I we have found a worse coach than Jeff Quinn in, in FBS football. Well, you know, I just, I as, go there. <laughs> oh no, I I don't know. I I mean, look, say what you want to say about Jeff Quinn. When he has the same talent as his opponent, typically he can give him a good game. Right now, now what he's lacked is the ability to to beat a better opponent, which you need to be able to do to be a great coach. But. UConn has a way better roster than they face today, and it did not look like it at all. So yeah, that was my surprise pick, by the way. I but think. UConn, I, I don't, I don't expect UConn to be good this year. They've lost too much. They haven't brought it back. They haven't repaired it. Uh, they, they hit their own talent cliff, and I mean, we sh- we have to beat UConn this year. And I think this makes it harder for us to beat UConn. I think. Uh, they ha- they have Michigan before us. They have I know they have a tough game. They have a, they have a after this they have a pretty tough schedule I think. So be- before this game I think you you have a loss to Michigan you expect it and you come to Buffalo mm-hmm. 
and that's going to be your your makeup game. After this, they they get Maryland, then they they get Michigan, and then they come to Buffalo. So I think if they come out of there two and one, if they come out of there one and two, it's kind of expected, and they're kind of sharp and ready. To, they're they're not they might not be that sharp and ready to go in the Buffalo game, which is going to be their first road game of the year. They lose to Towson, and let's say they lose to Maryland, they lose to Michigan. They're zero and three. They are mm-hmm. ready to kill Buffalo. This is the one game. After that, they go to Cincinnati. They go to Central Florida. They look great. They host Louisville, who's supposed to be a BCS team. They go to SMU, a good team. After that, they go to Temple, a team that can beat them. Rutgers. They don't see another win on their schedule until the, the home finale against Memphis in December. So I think those players, if they, are, if they show up 0-3 in Buffalo, they are circling it, starring the game, and they're, it's a must win. I think if they they beat Towson, they're one and two. It's kind of what they expected, and they might overlook this Buffalo game. They're not going to do that anymore. So it's going to make it harder. And Jeff Quinn can't be a better coach than Paul Pasqualoni because he played him twice and lost to him. Both games winnable. Jeff Quinn is not a good coach because we we've only won one game in which we trailed at the half. That game was against the University of Massachusetts uh, FCS team. So, and we needed a block punt to do that and a miraculous run from our fullback. So, it, until, Rashad Gene, I missed you. He's, he was a little bit of MVP for that for for that one game. He was our MVP, and then never yes, used again was. because Jeff Quinn. You you were so good. You were so good, kid. I'm going to retire you and never play you again. <laughs> Have a good life. Um, I, I, we were talking when, when we were watching the uh, Kent and the Turner Gill game this afternoon. That Kent went up seven. Turner Gill's team got the ball with four minutes left, and we said, "Oh, this is better. Gill is better when he's down seven late than when he's up seven late." And even though that gave us all heart problems five years ago, it's ten times better than what we do now. We are not safe with a ten-point lead. We're not, and we're dead if we have a 10-point deficit. And, and that's the game we've seen against UConn. It's, it's been 20 to 10 and with 27 minutes left in the game, and it's like, oh, this is over. You know, we're going to run three times. We're going we're gonna to throw incomplete passes. We're, we're just not going to do anything different. They're going to catch on the game. They're just going to run the ball. They might as well just take knees in the second half. And that's basically what UConn does. Um, there's nothing more depressing than charting that game last year. The UConn game... Uh, all Pascal only does is run the ball up the middle. All Jeff Quinn does is is run the ball up the middle. It's 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 like watching the computer play the computer on Madden. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it was a ten yard fight. It's like watching ten yard fight, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so if we if we lose that game, I'm I'm over. I'm, I'm done. I don't think there's a. I don't think you can come back from it. There was a there was a moment against Syracuse. Um, the last time they. They played us. I'm thinking 2007. 2007. Was a completely Seven. winnable game that we mm-hmm. that we let them off the hook, and then Syracuse was even worse for a little bit. And now Syracuse is a little bit back, and they're ACC, so they're gonna they're they're gonna get a little bit more money. They're not gonna mm-hmm. be at that level of vulnerability again, and it's just it hurts that we didn't get them then. Yeah. And if we don't get UConn now. I will be so upset. Last yeah, actually, year, we, actually, we don't even have a schedule forever after this. This is our this is our last of a two and two. Right, last year was our chance, last chance to get Pittsburgh. Um, mm. they went to the ACC, they were vulnerable last year. They've had four coaches in three years, so we we've let every three team off the month. Right, I mean, in in the Jeff Quinn tenure, we have let every team off the hook. Should we arrange something with Ward Manual? to say that the loser of that game gets to drag their coach out in the field and rip up the contract or the not signed contract. Can we could sell that out. I mean, if we if White wants a sellout, that could be the could be the coach, you know, we will put the losing coach's head on a pike in front of the winner's stadium because that that that's the end of their career at their current job. So yeah, if Jeff Quinn loses that game or if Pisquale loses that game, you know, that's it. I think if Pasquale loses that game, if they're if they're 0 and 4 or 1 and 3, he's done. I think if Quinn loses that game, he's, I think he's already win. done. I just think the body hasn't cooled down yet. I think the loss tonight sealed it. Probably, 
we'll you know, see. But, you know, be careful what you wish for. Ward is suddenly looking like a case of beginner's luck on that football coach uh, hiring process. He has he got Turner Gill, yeah. and now his last two coaches have been Pascaloni, who he's kept on. He has Ward, or he has uh, Quinn is his hire, and it's not looking too good, you know. So who is he going to get? Ohio, uh, UConn. That's, that, that, that's an excellent point. Uh, and, and and Gill wasn't his first choice. I mean, he had to. He worked his way down the ladder to get to Gill. I don't know who his first choice was that 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 first coaching hunt, but um, yeah, he. Who knows, right? Who knows if that first guy said yes, if 2008 would have happened. And it looks so, bad. The Randy Edsel would go from UConn to Maryland, which is kind of a lateral move, seeing that UConn mm-hmm. was a BCS team a few years ago. Uh, there must be something. I'm sure it's the recruiting, but there's something about UConn that is not good. I think UConn's like Kansas. Right. I mean, and I think a football coach knows that. I think it, it they're going to be a great basketball school, and every once in a while they'll up and surprise you in football, but you'll never get the fan buyout for football at a UConn or a Kansas or a Vanderbilt that you get for your basketball teams. And, and so, yeah, you coach there, you're in the great conference. You could go BCS bowling if all the stars fall the right way, but you're never going to structurally have what those other coaches have. All right, let's let's um, let's start to wrap this up because we're starting to go way over time here, right. and I and, trying to get this so this fits within our lives. Um, I just want to throw a quick shout-out to Stu Riddle and the soccer team for going undefeated in preseason, which included a win over Niagara, and that always gets you a thumbs-up from Bull Run when you beat Niagara at something. Um, you know, we, we, we have a, a soccer writer who will hopefully start turning out some content soon. Uh, I'm not aware of anything else that happened in the in the uh, you know non-revenue sport world. I know the the women's volleyball schedule came out, uh, but nothing else. Uh, things will start spinning up now. Um, if you have not right. yet put in your picks on Dave's Pick'em thread, find time to do that. Uh, no prizes this year because uh, Game Day Depot just isn't going to throw T-shirts around for a third year in a row. Uh, but it's still a lot of fun. And um, hope you guys sw- sign up next week. Conrad, you got anything to say? Um, yeah, I mean, just... Uh, looking at the soccer team, I didn't expect much from them. Most of the, the no one who scored a goal last year is still on the team. So, mm-hmm. new coach it looks like it's going to be a good transition, just like we have women's bas- uh, women's basketball last year with uh, Coach Jack. So, you know, yeah. let's beat Akron in that. If, so if we can't beat them in football, let's beat them in football. Uh, and <laughs> we also have women's soccer. They're coming out and they're looking pretty good. But they have a very deep squad, and I'm looking. They just they they did lose to Michigan State, but mm-hmm. uh, you know hopefully they have a they can get some wins as they start this week as well. Yeah, I've been fairly impressed with the coaches uh, Danny White has hired. I, I gotta say that it'll be interesting to see what wrestling does this year, but it seems like he finds coaches who are pretty good at using the talent they have, and I don't know if he just has a knack for that. If he's you know some of those coaches are just great at finding it. Um, but a lot of people ignore the non-revenue sports. But you got to give like schools like EMU their due. Even before Kent was really good at football, you got to give Kent their due. Um, and, and you start to build your programs up that way. It, it's you can't have. I, I believe you cannot have a, a successful football program and no successful non-revenue sports. I, I don't think you can sustain that way. I just think the energy in the athletic department's not there. So. Hopefully that we'll see soccer come out strong. Hopefully we'll see wrestling start to improve. Uh, hopefully last year's baseball team wasn't a fluke. Um, they return a lot of tail. Mike Burke, I think Mike Burke was just named the summer league pitcher of the year, and one of the uh, one of our batters was named the MVP of the season for the summer leagues, and it's killing me. I can't remember who it was. Uh, so, you know, there'll, there'll be fun things to watch this year. Let's just hope Jeff Quinn makes football fun to watch too. All right, Tyler see you guys next week. Who? Sorry, uh, Tyler, oh, Tyler Montner. Montner. Montner, yeah, that's or who it was. Yeah, yeah, he uh you know we we you know we we lost uh, we lost some some really important players this year, but we are returning a ton, especially pitchers next next year. So baseball will be fun once again. Uh this is my my mandatory baseball plug for Danny White to please play some games at Pilot Field or Coca-Cola Field or whatever they're calling it now. Um, your baseball team deserves to play some games at, at a facility at that level. 
uh, not at the park across the street from campus. Or in Rochester. <laughs> Monroe, yeah. All right, okay. see you all next week. Um, don't forget to pop on the game thread. We'll see you, the, see you Saturday. All right, bye. Bye.